Hello, Bell Posier. Welcome to the live. Um, I am trying to also get on Instagram and uh, I need to fiddle with this a bit before we start. And here we are. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. It's almost the weekend. Can't wait to have a few days off. Um, so, I'm gonna read better if I remove my glasses. Um, so, welcome. Uh, this is casted both on Instagram and on the Facebook group Bell Solution, uh, Bell Palsy Solution. And um, the one thing I'd like to say first is thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for making this community what it is. Um, and as you might have found out, you are not alone in this. In um, fighting for um, your facial function and what your face used to look like. Um, so you're not alone in this and there's, a, there's, there's some people out there that can help you even though um, we mostly hear about uh, the lack of support that we get from the medical community and um, there is a full community of people uh, that shares your experience and um, even if we are all experience facial paralysis differently uh, both physically and emotionally uh, there are some people that can help you so um, for those who don't know me uh, I am Pierre Buteau I'm a physical therapist uh, with over 21 years of experience and specifically eight years of experience working with facial paralysis patients after experiencing both Bell's palsy myself um, and despite recovering pretty fast, um, I was left with so many questions um, that were unanswered. And realizing many, if not most, uh, facial paralysis sufferers are not receiving the care that they deserve. So um, at first I realized that uh, that was from the therapy and rehab aspect, but quickly uh, I've kind of went online and saw that, uh, well, we are a very underserved population and um, uh, especially through the entire medical community, not just in the physical therapy and rehab um, arena. So um, so my experience with Bells was uh, basically my impetus to change all this. Um, and I basically have embraced, um, I guess, turning lemon into lemonade, if you will. And um, that said, I'm glad you came and I will start the live now. Uh, hopefully you will find this pertinent and interesting. And also, and I will mention that later in the live, um, I will offer a 15% coupon on the Bell's Palsy tutorial, um, which is the course that I have available online that's targeted to people that have been diagnosed with um, Bell's Palsy or Ramsey Hunt. Uh, in the last four months and it's basically perfect if you're new to this and are feeling completely lost um, with a lack of information available out there. So you will find out what to do and what not to do and how to do it uh, in this online course. Uh, it's not, it is not for the treatment of synkinesis um, as that need to be and is very individualized and should be. You cannot treat synkinesis by yourself with just uh, a few stretches you found online, so please know that. Uh, and that's also why when I receive um, messages and pictures of people um, sending me screenshots or video, that's just is, that doesn't even scrape the surface of um, what I need to see in order to help you. So here we go. Um, so. Um, this answer was inspired by a feedback I got from Shell. She's on the Facebook uh, Bell's Palsy Solution group. And she, uh, she wanted to know, and so you just learned you have uh, Bell's Palsy. Where do you go from here? Uh, man, this is going to be a long answer. Uh, I don't do short, so um, here we go. Uh, so I could go on and on um, and adding more details uh, with each sentence, but I'm going to try to do my best to summarize it. So if you are most like like most people, you will probably only notice something is very is very wrong once your face uh, is not moving. Uh, there's often some precursor to developing Bell's palsy or Ramsey Hunt or other type of idiopathic paralysis. Um, uh, but Bell's palsy, which is the most common, 
what you're going to ha generally have is uh, some headaches, some pressure in your ear, some earache, some tension in your neck, in the back of your ear. Um, and uh, for me, it was pretty sudden. It was actually, I was blowing my nose and my mouth was open and my jaw locked up, actually. And uh, locked, I wasn't able to close it. It was pretty painful. I had a spasm for 10 seconds. Um, and then uh, my face felt kind of weird the rest of the day. And um, I woke up with my face paralyzed on the right side. Um, so the thing is, with this, uh, this could be a lot of other things that are creating those symptoms. So most people, when they have that, they, they, there's no way you're going to know that's, oh, well, this is going to be Bell's palsy tomorrow. There's there's no way and there's really no point in trying to um, to kind of dig more into this because it's just generally the symptoms can be many different things. Uh, sometimes it, it can last for several weeks, though, before you develop full-blown um, facial paralysis. Um, so um, obviously when people um, uh, wake up or just suddenly lose function of their face and movement, um, so they're going to be freaking out and wondering if they had a stroke, wondering if, wondering if they should get medical attention. And uh, if that is you today, you happen to find us, I would say, yes, please uh, get some medical attention. Uh, I'm here to tell you that you should get medical attention uh, now. And although this is not as serious uh, and a of a medical emergency as a stroke, uh, Bell's palsy needs to be diagnosed as soon as possible. Or facial par the type of facial paralysis you might have needs to be diagnosed uh, in order to receive the appropriate medication. Uh, that is the golden standard in treating idiopathic facial paralysis. So there are some exceptions to this if you're in your third trimester or pregnant and pregnant. Uh, and diabetic, um, you can't generally take steroids or uh, depending on what your doctor wants on a very low dose. But anyway, that's something to discuss with your doctor. So uh, you should leave uh, the ER, the urgent care, optimally with a round of steroids and antivirals. Um, and uh, you will likely be told to follow up with your primary doctor, which some people will be lucky and do right away. Some people wait a few weeks to do so. A uh, problem with this is that too often um, the patient have not been, give, not been given enough information as to what to expect, what to do, particularly uh, with their eyes and um, um, how to manage the fact that their eye is not closing at all. Uh, and it's going to get irritated, it's going to get dry, and it should also be the priority to address at this point, at this stage of the paralysis. Uh, as having a dry eye and not being able to close it can lead to complication and potentially blindness. So this is no joke. Uh, I think that should be taken a little bit more seriously. Uh, and that's where I think uh, a lot of people are failed because they end up, some people end up going to the ophthalmologist, but um, that can take a while to get in, as you know. So I would, um, as soon as you leave the ER, I would probably schedule to see a, an ophthalmologist. No matter if maybe in two weeks you might be all better and you might not need it but at least you have that covered so um um let's see where was i at um so tipping technique the use of goggles eye chambers to prevent dryness and irritation of your eye uh, are things that can be extremely helpful but are too often not even mentioned in that initial appointment uh, this is the first thing i do when i see a patient that um, are recent and uh, luckily uh, found me early on and I start working with them early on. So uh, my, would, my advice would be to, even if you're in your first two weeks of dealing with Bell's palsy, yeah, schedule that uh, appointment with the ophthalmologist to ensure the health of your eye, uh, especially since getting in, as I said, can be a long waiting game. So um, that would be the first doctor I would see for sure. Um, that said, I still think that it's a good idea to keep your GP in the loop, uh, but I'm not sure they will have much to say besides the wait and see approach that most of you have probably heard. Um, um, at that point, you've so um, you've you've been if if you're off the meds though, uh, you finish your prescription of steroids and antivirals, and you are noticing a significant increase in pain. Discomfort or dizziness, those are all signs of actually of Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Um, so please advocate for yourself and be adamant about potentially getting a second round 
of steroid and antivirals and gabapentin to address the pain at the same time. Uh, you can request to meet with an otolaryngologist at that time would be great. Um, and they are the best placed doctor to address your condition. Um, so if you can get into an otolaryngologist before a GP, just go straight to the otolaryngologist. Um, that would be ideal. Um, and uh, and you'll score extra point if you are actually uh, scoring an appointment uh, at official nerve center or with an official uh, official nerve surgeon. Uh, generally, otolaryngologist, um, maybe a plastic surgeon, but at that point probably an otolaryngologist. So. Um, one thing to know is that the doctors you'll see uh, will not be able to tell you how long your facial paralysis is going to be uh, going on for. Um, they, they have no way of telling you at this point how long it is going to be. Uh, now, if you're seeing them around three weeks marks post onset and you are not seeing any change at all, you will likely have a slower recovery. And um, I would advocate for possibly getting another round of meds at that point. So like I said, there isn't, there's no way of telling uh, you, the patient, uh, nobody can, uh, I wouldn't either if you come to me early on, uh, that it's gonna take you, uh, it's gonna take a uh, tech month, it's gonna take four months, it's gonna take six, eight, ten, nine months to recover. There's really is no way of knowing. Uh, ultimately, what dictates your recovery length though, and your likelihood of running into some complication like synchinesis later on, um, it, that's the degree of nerve injury you suffered. If you suffered a grade one facial nerve uh, injury, um, which is that's called neuropraxia, uh, for anybody interested. Uh, so only the axon and uh, the myelin sheath around the axon have been injured. And um, that's the best case scenario. And generally it means that you will be recovered in three months. Um, the other degree of injury, um, like grade two, um, which is axonotmesis or grade three and four, which are neurotmesis, uh, but without the full uh, for the grade three and four, without the full separation of the outer layers of the nerve, as you would with grade five. Uh, grade five being a complete severance of the nerve from a blunt trauma, like a car accident, or possibly during uh, a surgery for something else, official surgery for something else. Um, so. That if you're you fall into the grade two, three, and four, that means you will have a longer journey in your facial recovery, and you are also at more risk of developing synchinesis. Um, please note that there is nothing you did or could have done to prevent this degree of injury, um, uh, except maybe um, you know being within the first 72 hours being on um, steroids and antivirals. And even then, even then, there's plenty. I know some people that literally were in the ER within three hours, two hours of, um, of their facial paralysis starting and they still had a rough go. So it is not, um, it is not a guarantee. I think it's ideal and recommended to do that, but it is not a guarantee that you're not going to have uh, a very long recovery and uh, later on complications. So please know that. Um, but yeah, please know that there's nothing you did. Um, you couldn't have prevented. Um, and you can't, you, at this point, you can't overthink it uh, because that won't help. That, that kind of stuff only brings on stress. You can't dwell on the past. You can look at, oh my gosh, I should have done that, 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 and that, no matter how long you are in the, in the recovery process. Um, just thinking about this kind of stuff only brings negativity and it really doesn't help. So uh, just concentrate on the knowledge you're getting maybe today and then uh, what you should be doing in the future. So um, other symptoms that you might experience and that are very common when you have Bell's palsy and for simple reasons, uh, uh, that the facial nerve also innervates various structures in your face. Um, and so you might experience excessive tearing or excessive dryness of your eye, dryness of your mouth with lack of saliva. You could get hyperacusis, which is sensitivity to loud noises. Uh, since the facial nerves uh, innervate the stapedius muscle, uh, which is responsible for dampening those loud noises around you. Um, one thing that in, uh, that I hear often from patients is that they are feeling some numbness on their face. 
And although it is not rare that numbness should that should be extremely mild numbness, the reason is that the sensation of your face is actually coming from and controlled by the trigeminal nerve. It's another cranial nerve, so not the facial nerve. So if you do truly have just Bell's palsy with the facial nerve involved, you should not really uh, you should not really feel too much um, too much numbness in your face. Um, and um, by the way, if your trigeminal nerve is involved, you're generally going to feel a lot of pain in your face. And um, the trigeminal nerve involvement can happen on its own as well. And uh, sometimes that happens because of compression of blood vessels against it. And that's extremely painful, like I said. And that is called tic douleur. But I am getting carried away here. Um, so I hope that was an answer to to um, to that question. Um, I hope this will guide you in what you should be asked, what you should ask to your physician as well, and how to advocate for yourself a little bit, um, and um, uh, being asked to be referred to the right professional. So to recap, the first thing is to advocate for getting the right meds, which includes steroids and antiviral, um, uh, uh, because a lot of people actually are not still these days not given antivirals. So I would really advocate for that. Um, the next thing to ask is uh, a referral to the ophthalmologist or an otolaryngologist. Um, and I also ask to be referred to a facial therapist, even if your chance are low, um, since there are not a lot of us in this country. I think we are, I'm not even know, I think we're probably under 30 um, for the whole US. So that's not a lot. Um, and uh, also, the, the reason for physicians to not know much about facial rehab is that it is not wide. It is not widespread. I mean, like I said, we're we're few and far between. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of physical therapists do not learn facial rehab in school, uh, so there's very little general knowledge and exposure about it with the population and even in the medical field. Truly, uh, so hopefully, if you're watching this, you know that this is a thing and that there is truly some people that can support you guide you and educate you about the process of facial rehab, no matter what stage of um, recovery you are in. Um, so from many people, another question, supplements. So that's a very common question for people, from people um, online and uh, in my practice as well, asking me if they should be taking supplements to help the healing. Uh, you may have read about vitamin B12 helping with nerve recovery, but I haven't seen really personally good really good studies that are uh, conclusive um, and that were also done on human because a lot of them are were done on rats uh, so not a lot of those studies showing significant improvement in idiopathic facial paralysis condition just by ingesting um, capsules of b12 so um, the nerves are the slowest healing tissue in the human body and you cannot speed that healing process by ingesting something or receiving treatment using various modalities and machine. Um, seeing people with facial nerve injury daily, I can tell you that um, I have not seen one patient miraculously recovering after ingesting B12 um, or, or receiving passive modalities treatment. Um, that leads me to another question that I get all the time is acupuncture. Um, so same thing, medical studies on the effect of acupuncture on Bell's palsy um, are not done well and uh, are mediocre at best in order to make a good good conclusion, I think. That said, I think a lot of people respond to acupuncture initially uh, when the level of stress is so high and that gives them the opportunity to relax and um, lay down for, you know, 30 to 30 minutes to an hour uh, and just have maybe a quiet, calm environment where they can kind of... Um, just meditate and rest um, and, and some of these people will with acupuncture of, or not heal fast and then uh, these people will probably become the next spokesperson for acupuncture because it must have it must have been what healed them right um, though there's not really any scientific proof to that um, and basically if you just have acupuncture and then you just heal in uh, you know the first couple months uh, it's generally it's very 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 likely that you just naturally healed. Um, you had a mild case, like I did. Um, I was done in just under three weeks, and uh, that was super mild. And yes, I did some things. I did some things that I shouldn't have done actually, 
thankfully I was okay with it. Uh, but I also was not super versed, like I said, initially on what to do. And um, so I did, I, I might have done nothing and might have healed. That's possible. Um, so again, I'm not against acupuncture, but I just think that acupuncture alone will certainly not prevent tightness in your face um, from, um, from like getting rid of it. Uh, it will not, uh, and also will not prevent complication from synkinesis. So I'm gonna have a little sip. So um, something else that somebody posted. Um, how do you stay positive? Uh, that is a loaded question that depends a lot on the person and how they cope, uh, adversity and all that. But I personally think that you owe it to yourself to stay positive um, as stress and negativity can really affect the healing process. Uh, I know it's easier said than done, but it doesn't really help to stress and um, wonder how severe your injury can be since only time will really reveal the true extent. Of your of your facial injury and um, there are some resources if you are severely struggling with this and I would really urge uh, anyone uh, that is dealing with that to to get in touch with a mental therapist if you identify with isolation struggling with your day-to-day -day activity don't want to get out of bed uh, don't want to leave your house uh, don't want to go to work um, and really are feeling depressed. Um, all of this is real and, um, and um, you can't ignore it because it's not gonna help. So I'm with you here. Um, I, I totally understand it. Um, it's, you know, you're not making this up. You are truly in that predicament and I think you need help. So uh, again, all of this depends on a lot on the type of the person you are and on your personality. Some people are able to cope better with adversity, uh, but it does not mean that the people that do not cope with um, that should accept it. So mental therapists and psychiatrists are uh, and should be part of um, your team in uh, treating your uh, facial paralysis and uh, part of the people, uh, the type of practitioner that you should be um, seeing. So. Um, that is very important. Uh, I have actually just posted this week on Instagram uh, about the fact that facial paralysis is also a communication disorder and not a cosmetic disorder. Um, it can be a cosmetic disorder, yes, eventually, uh, but it's first and foremost a communication disorder since your facial expression, uh, it communicates your feeling and your state of mind. And without this, it can be difficult to be understood, listened, taken in consideration and just living in society. Um, it affects how you eat, how you drink, kiss, speak in public, affect, um, affect your confidence and uh, a lot of other unpleasant things. So, so from that, uh, that point, I do believe that you should seek mental health as needed in addition to someone that can treat facial paralysis um, and see it's just otolaryngologist, mental therapist, facial therapist, all of these people can help you and should all be communicating together uh, in order to treat you um, in the best way possible. So um, in the meantime, I would recommend you to decrease all factor of stress in your life, um, avoid any toxic situation uh, and, and environment that are negative, that are stressing you out. Um, and for some people that could just be Watching the news, um, especially, sadly, uh, nowadays, um, the news from the Middle East, um, the last few days are pretty depressing. Um, and I kind of feel for everybody living over there. So um, meditation and spirit spirituality can also be really helpful. Um, and um, if that is your jam, I would say just go for it. Um, Another person on Instagram asked the following question. Uh, when do you know what to do as part of your facial rehab? I have read so many different opinions, like doing faces, chewing gum, using electrical stimulation to make the muscle contract better. So to reinforce what I've already mentioned earlier, you cannot speed up the nerve healing. And this is why trying to make faces and making 
exaggerated facial movement is not only useless, but it could also lead to severe tightness and synkinesis later on. Um, I like to compare this to another situation uh, that might be easier for you to understand. Uh, it's if you try to watch TV and if you knew that the cord is either not plugged in the wall or, um, or broken, um, well, nothing's going to show up on your screen. So if that cable does not work, um, it, it's like I said, failed or, or cut, uh, you're going to have no pictures that's going to show up. So that's the same with the facial nerve that's an injured and it is not carrying any signal, um, any or any significant signal. You can have a very mild one that end up not being enough to make a muscle contract. But if it's not carrying a, a nerve signal to, um, to, to that muscle, you're just wasting your time um, trying to make your face move by attempting to contract your muscle even harder. So you're going to engage your opposite side even more. That side's going to get even tighter. Uh, it's it's not going to be great. So um, so that is um, um, where am I? Yeah. So that's in the flaccid paralysis stage. So which is the first stage of Bell's palsy, and um, and that's that's basically um, what generally when people try to start moving their face when there's absolutely no movement, you just don't do that. Um, so. During that stage, though, what you can do and what your priority should be is eye closure uh, with the correct and appropriate stretching of your eyelid, possibly proper um, uh, taping technique to assist your eye in closing and being less irritated during the day or at night, working on restoring the symmetry of your fa face by stretching your non-involved side, which is likely overworking constantly and is becoming tight from this. Uh, so this is something I see every day while during the course of a treatment, just stretching certain muscle of the non-involved side will completely restore the symmetry of the mouth. So again, if you're in the flaccid paralysis um, stage and you know your face looks like this, um, working on that symmetry and stretching that that strong side will uh, really be uh, will really be um, beneficial. Um, so, of course, this will require subsequent daily stretching to the area for at least some a long period of time, several months at least, in order to maintain and regain the full symmetry. Uh, during this time, keeping your face mobile is important, but doing it passively with massage and stretches also on your involved side. So there are many massage and stretching techniques to target certain areas, and I can't show you all. It would take all day. Um, I also don't know your specific uh, situation. Uh, but um, on my Instagram account and on YouTube, I show various techniques that can certainly be very helpful um, and might be enough. But at the end of the day, it will depend on your presentation and everybody has a different presentation. So um, this is why being assessed by a facial therapist is key in, in learning uh, early on the right things to do, uh, the treatment approach, uh, the, the techniques, the emplacements, um, and also what not to do. Massaging and gently stretching your involved side during that stage will help your brain not forget that it's still connected to your face and um, and um, that these various and these various muscles are still connected. Um, and all doing this um, will give basically some good feedback to your brain uh, for the continuation of your healing. So, um, so. Yes, taping technique, again, for the flaccid, uh, the flaccid um, stage might be helpful to help support your face uh, with some tapes, and I'm not going to really demonstrate, but just holding and supporting your face up with, as it's drooping this way, you can hold it in that way. Um, now, the second stage of facial paralysis is paresis, and this is when, as your nerve continues healing uh, and start delivering a signal to your muscle, you're starting to see more movement uh, returning as well as more uh, tone in this muscle, which is the opposite of the flaccid face in the first stage that is overpowered. But um, uh, but again, your strong side is overworking and that leads to asymmetries. So during that stage, stretching should continue, um, uh, of course, on that on that strong that strong side if it's still um, creating some asymmetries. 
um, and it will uh, address tightness and um, you should also do this on the affected side because uh, as you're starting to get a little bit more tone uh, quickly what's going to happen it might switch to the, your involved side getting actually tighter um, so not contracting a muscle for several weeks or possibly month it does lead to tightness um, and then fibrosis uh, fibrosis formation which will prevent proper muscular contraction so not until this stage uh, the paresis stage will you want to move specific muscle and retrain specific movement um, the exception being eye closure, I tend to start this early on, even in the flaccid stage, because it's so important. Um, this is also uh, where things could go wrong for a lot of people who are so excited to see some return of movement uh, that they will forcefully retrain their face into mass patterns. That kind of stuff. Um, of thinking that's a good thing. Um, and uh, your face... Uh, Instead, in, instead of like doing mass pattern, what you want is basically uh, a smooth, controlled, isolated movement, uh, which is what facial movement emotions really are. Uh, we never show sadness or, uh, you know, laughter like this. We, nobody does that. So um, facial movements are a very complicated, coordinated action between one or a few muscles contracting while others stay quiet. Um, you cannot achieve that by fastly and forcefully practicing those rogue uh, facial movement pattern, right? Um, if you do, you will only re-emphasize the tightness. Um, the wrong movement pattern, again, that is going to be, become ingrained in your brain, which you definitely don't want. And uh, potentially, you'll make your synchinesis worse uh, if you were to have synchinesis. Uh, this is highly specialized exercise that does not look like any other type of rehab, physical therapy, physiotherapy that you might ever had for any other condition. Um, your facial muscles are and behave extremely differently than your biceps and your quads. So um, this is where the guidance of a facial therapist can be extremely helpful in order to learn this movement correctly and prevent making things worse. On a side note, facial therapy is mostly done by the patient at home. Once you've been assessed and educated with a home program, um, you could have, depending on the severity of your symptoms, uh, require a few other appointments, possibly need therapy for 18 months. Uh, that's possible. Uh, but those appointments are spread out uh, as the healing of the nerve is um, progressing. And, um, and also in order to give you enough time between appointments to practice that home program. So generally, uh, early on, uh, I, my... I see my patient every two or three weeks for maybe a month, no more than two. And then we, uh, we decrease that to um, much less often, every six weeks, every two months, um, and, and so on. So um, let's see. So now the third stage of synchinesis, um, which is when so many people finally found out about facial therapy. And after months or years of research, maybe find a facial therapist that can potentially help them. So this, and I will repeat it uh, as I get this question probably 10 times a week. You cannot treat synchronesis on your own at all. There's no way. You need actually a professional that can help you, that know how to assess your face and know what to work on. So you need a trained therapist that can fully assess your condition and determine your, um, determine your synchronistic pattern, you said this, which muscles are synchinetic, which muscles are responsible for basically blocking the muscle you want to use from working and making other muscle participates. Um, determining the force vectors of these muscles with your facial movement can only be done by somebody that's trained, either in person or online. In person is always better. Online is the next, be next best thing. So um, only a highly individualized home program to the patient will be helpful. That patient will also be very likely required some uh, chemo denervation or Botox injection in order to manage their symptoms and complement facial therapy. So um, if you didn't know already, and that might be, let me be the carrier of bad news, um, synchinesis is not reversible. And once you develop it, it will take a lot of work in performing the home program, um, the dedication from the patient, in order to see a change. 
um, and likely the Botox and possibly some surgical uh, procedure. But some people recover 90 to 95%, while some other will be less lucky and could benefit from the next step, which will be a consultation with a facial surgeon, um, otolaryngologist or plast plastic surgeon generally that is trained in those procedures, obviously. Um, and th they can perform many different procedures to assist in regaining facial symmetry, control, and help the patient return to a more normal life. So in regards to synchinesis, please know that 60 to 70% of Bell's palsy patients will recover with no complication. Um, so I hope you're one of them. Uh, but the latest statistics shows that 30 to 40 percent will have some to some very different degrees level of complication which could be from very very mild to severe um, so in to go back to the those exercise there and what you should be doing um, this is when um, I demonstrate all of these uh, in the um, Bell's Palsy tutorial that's available online uh, and um, I demonstrate those neuromuscular retraining activities as well as a massage and stretching technique in the Bell's Palsy tutorial. Uh, and that's on my website. Um, I'll give you a code for 15% off today. It's 15OFF, uh, OFF being in capital. So 15OFF, capital, all attached. Um, carrying on to my next question. Uh, so. Something I saw uh, in a question I got on Instagram. Someone commented, so many professionals and other brush it off like it's no big deal. Uh, I know. I agree that from the patient standpoint, the medical treatment um, of this condition can be the pit uh, with lack of knowledge and follow up through the medical f throughout the medical field. I personally decided to change that when I had Bell's palsy and realized how, how little physical, as a physical therapist myself, I knew about this condition and also on what to do. So I, I, I now feel that's my calling to help people treat this and manage it. Um, and um, um, my advice on this would be to advocate for yourself as much as possible. Uh, don't take no for an answer. Uh, please continue looking somebody that can help. We are out there. We might be hard to find, but we are. Um, if you have not found one, uh, the right professional that will listen to you, be empathic, um, and that can guide you in the right direction, then um, just keep looking. There, there are some of them. Uh, we might be uh, a rare breed, but we are out there. So uh, just because you had one medical encounter that did not go well with one practitioner does not mean that you should stop there. Uh, and like my patient that was told that that neural just had no time for her um, last week and uh, it was just a cosmetic issue and she might never recover, which, you know, how is that helping? How is that caring and providing care? That I don't know, but um, this is, I was pretty furious when she told me that. Um, but please continue your search and shop around for a doctor or a therapist that actually knows about this condition and can guide you through your recovery. Uh, so if you're still searching for that unicorn, what I would do is try to uh, Google facial nerve center in your area um, or an otolaryngology department, often, very often based um, at a university hospital. I think that would be your best bet in, um, in your search and in finding some answers. Um, I had another question that was um do you think emg guided botox injection are more six are more successful i don't have the data on that uh, i've not seen a study which directly compared chemo denervation with or without emg um, um the study that i looked at uh, using emg and mentioned the increased consistency between treatments though uh, between injection to the same area um, more consistent uh, with where with the location of the injection. Um, what I found also reported being able to identify better which muscles are purely synkinetic uh, with isolated facial movement of another muscle. So that helps identify the synkinetic pattern. Um, that study also showed EMG used to assess the degree of hyperkinesis for a select muscle at rest in comparison with the unaffected muscle to guide treatment dosing. And if you don't know, EMG is uh, basically a, um, a nerve study 
and um, inner in uh, sending electricity to one part of the nerve to fig and then observe their reaction so that said I'm unsure of how common that is uh, how many doctors office would actually use EMG while uh, performing the Botox injection uh, which is also called chemo denervation um, I don't know the practicality the cost uh, which could very likely be translated into another charge to the patient so um, my side notes though on Botox and chemo denervation uh, Botox is an entire part of treating synchinesis and when you're required to have Botox I would highly suggest to consult and getting your Botox injection only from a physician trained with the face or from a practitioner trained um, in administering Botox injection. Um, in different countries, it might be some different profession. Uh, I know of one of the most amazing facial therapists in England, uh, hi Trina. Um, she does uh, Botox injection herself. Um, she has a certificate in this and she's getting some good results. So um, again, that depends on your location. Um, so yes, I would I would get this from an otolaryngologist mostly and a plastic surgeon uh, in the US uh, because they specialize in the face uh, and even better if this obviously specialize in the facial nerve. So um, just, just like every other medical condition, you would want someone that knows their anatomy and uh, is doing this day in and day out. So um, Basically, uh, that does not include your beauty salon, uh, neighborhood beauty spa. So, um, another question that I had was about chin, uh, dimples, specifically uh, why it occurs so frequently with facial paralysis, and if there's other ways besides Botox to get rid of it. So, generally, the dimples that, hap uh, that happens and become more marked during facial paralysis stem from the fact that the muscle in your chin uh, the muscles in your chin are becoming tighter, uh, particularly the mentalis, which is this very tiny little muscle. I will show you on here. That muscle right here, just very close to the midline. Um, so that one gets really tight. Um, and that was, that's going to create that dimple. So my first suggestion would be to stretch your mentalis. And again, I will demonstrate uh, mentally stretch but you might have to tweak around depending on your presentation and depending on where the tight fibers are located so you could also if there's extreme if it's extremely sensitive at first you could do a trigger point release um, which would include bringing your thumb right there and then hold it and then just holding like this to the level of tolerance holding this nice and steady for a minute And then after a minute, kind of compare how it feels compared to the other side. Is it similar? And I would do this until it feels closer to similar. Or you could also stretch your mentalis this way. And hold that. all that in um, for a good minute. Sorry, I was letting some people in, in here, uh, it seems like. Um, sorry, I haven't paid attention to this because there's too much, too much things to talk about. So, um, yeah, uh, let's see. Um, so that's for, that's for the dimple. Again, uh, if you're tight, I would try those techniques. You might have other things to do and you might need some Botox as well. That's very possible. Um, another thing real quick, the mentalis, your DAO, this muscle right here, your boxinator, and your platysma. Platysma, mentalis, DAO, boxinator. These are the muscle that are the culprit in keeping your smile down and generally and not um, and not allowing your full smile so those four are definitely uh, priorities to um, to stretch if you want to regain your smile um, and 
I would do this ad nauseum for sure. Um, so I was also remembered by a Bell's Palsy Solution group member and also past patient, um, I Jenny, uh, to reinforce preventing the use of electrical stimulation. Um, this past patient struggled significantly with synkinesis after being sent to a physical therapist by her physician who was not trained in rehabbing facial paralysis and ended up doing several sessions of electrical stimulation. Uh, and that made her tighter and reinforced that synchinesis. So um, the reason to not use electrical stimulation is that you cannot force, again, muscle to contract um, if there is no electrical si signal going to them. And adding electrical stimulation will not make, make them contract any better. Uh, actually, study shows that um, providing extra electrical stimulation uh, can actually damage and delay the nerve healing. Um, um, so, again, I would not use electrical stimulation. The other thing that it does, it creates mass pattern, so it's going to reinforce that synchinesis. That's basically what it's going to do. Generally, those electrical stimulation have those huge pads that you're going to put on your face, and you're, it's contracting everything. You cannot, uh, you cannot isolate one movement, and everything's going to contract. It's going to do this and um, you're just gonna get tighter. You're reinforcing the tightness and you're also teaching your, your brain to kind of move everything together, uh, which once again is synchinesis. And um, that is why do not use electrical stimulation. I get that question over and over. It's like, what about this, this, uh, this pen thing that just like, I'm like, no, you're just wasting your time. You, you should probably be stretching instead of using anything uh, I would be very careful with anything that's fatty, like fads about equipment and stuff that are helpful, supposedly, uh, that has absolutely, there's no proof to any of those claims. And um, I think you would be likely wasting your time. There, now there's some stuff that people find uh, very often on their own that, that works for them uh, and stretching and with some piece of equipment. I like a gua sha, um, gua sha uh, tool, for example, to stretch my boxinator, and that works out. That works very well uh, if you're tired of using fingers. But um, um, the same patient also reminded me to remind everyone that addressing the tightness in your face is key. And the most important in treating the effect of facial paralysis and treating synchinesis stretching, synchinesis, um, stretching, it's, it's going to allow you to regain symmetry of your face initially when the overactive non-involved side becomes too strong and becomes tight from overuse. It then becomes important to stretch the side, in, uh, uh, the side that's involved for soft tissue mobility and also tactile stimulation. So that side of your face um, to, to, to that side, yeah, so your involved side, your palsy side. So your brain becomes less involved um, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm mixing my, my thoughts here. Let me let me start this. So yeah, the stretching initially again um, to the non-involved side to, rec to regain symmetry and but also gently stretching the involved side to just basically stimulate it and then tell your brain that yeah, there's still something attached to it. So um, uh, then once you're in the paralysis stage and you regain some more movement, this is going to become tight and you need, you're going to have to be more aggressive with those stretches. So um, it, it, what you do really depends on the stage that you're in. And this is why uh, it's important to, to get the right guidance on this. Um, I have a last minute question from Sherry. She's on the Bell's Palsy Solution group. Uh, and she's asking, and she was wondering if it's possible that tightness uh, can even stem from the backside and top of the head on the affected side. Uh, yes, definitely, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of muscle here that kind of blends and communicates together. Uh, I did a post on ear stretching. Uh, I just did that with a patient this morning. Uh, and all of this can be really tight your scalp being tight there as well. Um, your scalp here blends with your frontalis muscle in your forehead. Um, you might have to 
do things like this and holding that might relieve a lot of pressure just holding that position there for a good minute as well as here and again the key with stretching hold 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 at least 30 seconds if not a minute if not two with some certain stretch so I would definitely do this um, good so this is kind of all I had prepared uh, I think I have if you let me check I have a few um, something somebody posted um, Tony in the group posted what treatment should my physical therapist give me Kaiser does nothing for me but Botox you should see official therapist because a regular physical therapist is not gonna know that um, I know because I was both um, and trust me nobody knows if you just go to your regular physical therapy clinic they're not gonna know and a good test for this would be to ask that therapist uh, even before you schedule or if you're already there ask if they know something about synchinesis if they don't don't even try to work with them because they, they're not gonna know they're gonna treat your um, facial paralysis and the facial muscle the same way they treat a knee injury a calf injury and so on and so on and um, those muscles work extremely differently um, let's see what else do I have um, somebody say I found a physical therapist uh, in Florida that's treating Bell's palsy they said to put heat on the non Bell's palsy side as it is overworked uh, no heat on the Bell's, Bell's side uh, also massage and stretch the non Bell's side and only exercise the bell side. I have mild synchinesis, it doesn't sound correct. You're right, it's not correct. I think, uh, is she really uh, trained in uh, in uh, addressing facial paralysis? Um, so I would not, certainly not use ice. Uh, I would only use heat on both sides. Heat will help uh, dilate blood vessels. It will help muscles relax. And um, that should be really beneficial, especially if your face is so tense and so tender. Uh, start always start with heat, five to ten minutes. Uh, it's a good good reason to relax before you do your exercise, your stretches. So I would start with that. Um, no heat on the bell sides. I that is absolutely uh, BS uh, in my opinion. Um, and I know that it is technically an inflammation of the nerve. Um, but um, the, um, that is one exception as to applying heat to an inflamed area that actually works better uh, and ice you're just gonna make your face even tighter so please don't try that um, I think what else exercising the bell side uh, again we've compared to what I said earlier absolutely not if you do not have any movement and I do not like to use the word exercise because it's not, it's very deceptive, a deceptive of a word. People are gonna think that they need to force and all that. And I just don't like that. Um, so I'm just gonna call it neuromuscular re-education. Um, but especially if you have, you have mild synchinesis. So you're in the third stage. Uh, you can certainly put some heat, no ice, massage and stretch. But at that point, if you're in the synchinesis, I think this is when you need help. From somebody that can help you um, and there's several people in Florida I, I'm, I'm licensed in Florida I can help you as well um, and let's see I think somebody else texted me something else I'm gonna check um, but I think it might take me a minute because I don't want to close that window let me check here go uh, let's see here no nope, maybe not um, real quick if you have uh, any let me see if there's any question in the live on Instagram um, I, re I answered those questions that were on Facebook um, how to minimize eye closure while smiling um, so that's going to require some cheek stretch that's going to require some 
some eyelid stretch uh, and being very specific with this and also practicing your smile in a very smooth, slow, very limited at first um, because it sounds like you have synkinesis. So you need to do this in a neuromuscular rehab kind of way. And this is gonna be have to be extremely slow and doing this is not gonna help. You need to first stretch, need, identify the areas that are, that are tight um, and then uh, stretch them and then practice your smile within a non-synkinetic range. So if you smile and you're here and this is tightening up, that means you're going too far. So and this is where the dosing and learning how to dose, this is where official therapists can guide you with this. Um, this is not easy. And this is why people people think they can do it at home or by themselves. And uh, to be honest, good luck, because um, it's it's you you likely need some 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 um, cueing, verbal, tactile, visual, all of that um, uh, from someone and somebody to coach you in, in, in doing this. Um, what if there is pain when doing those movement you recommended? Um, so pain. Um, is it soreness? Is it pain? Is it tension? People define pain very differently, so it, it depends. If it, but if it's pain to you, and if it's, I would say, the type of pain that um, would lead you to having to take something for the pain, then um, I think you might want to talk to your doctor about uh, possibly getting some gabapentin. Gabapentin is the drug of choice for uh, nerve pain. And that can be really helpful when you have that. Um, and I think, um, but if generally there might be pain with Bell's palsy, especially as it, the first few days, but if it persists and if you have other symptoms, but really severe pain in your face, in your ear, this might be a Ramsey hunt um, that requires more antivirals that needs to require gabapentin. So um, I would um, discuss that with your physician that can prescribe that. Um, let's see what else. Is there any other question? Uh, stretch to get rid of the dimple. We talked about that. Uh, and thank you for the nice comment here. Um, hope every, everything is good in Romania. I see that you are logged in. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I think right now this is all the questions I have. Um, I think maybe I should do this more often uh, to answer everybody's question. Um, and I hope you are getting the help that you deserve, that you will find somebody to work with you. Um, again, I'm available to work uh, with a lot of people. There's a few locations and states that I am unable to work legally because I don't have a license, but I'm getting there. I'm getting, I have more and more license. I have license in about uh, 13 states right now. Uh, and that list is growing up. Um, so if you are interested in working with me, we can certainly, uh, uh, in the comment under this, this live, I will put um, the link and the links are in my profiles anyway, uh, on how to find me, how to schedule with me. Um, and again, uh, I will give uh, that 15% off for the Bell's Palsy tutorial to anybody that, again, is in those first four months uh, that is uh, hopefully lucky to have find us today. Um, I know in the first few months, a lot of people are just being bounced around, sometimes between several doctors and without much more information. Um, but if you've already found us by digging in online, um, we are here to help you and that uh, tutorial is available and I'm also available to work with you. So um, I guess right on the dot, it's about 59 minutes. Um, so uh, thank you so much to everybody for being here. Instagram that way, Facebook that way. Um, I hope to do that soon again. Um, continue sending me questions. Um, I think without your questions, I wouldn't have done this. So. Thank you all for participating and you have an excellent rest of the day and weekend and take care um, and keep working hard on your bounce palsy.
Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.